This is Rob Gray from ASU and PerceptionAction.com. Today on the Perception in Action podcast, my interview with Bruce Hoyer, martial arts coach at the Next Edge Academy in South Dakota. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. In today's episode, my interview with Bruce Hoyer from Next Edge Academy. Bruce is a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and is a two-time world championship medalist. He currently teaches a variety of different MMA disciplines. In the interview, we discuss how Bruce has employed a variety of different ideas from sports science research into his coaching practice, including using a flipped classroom, observational learning, giving feedback, and reducing interference in motor learning. Hope you enjoy. Not 10 years ago, I was a child. I was a good boy and you let me go. Now I'm on a talk show, talk show. All right, today my guest is Bruce Hoyer, martial arts coach for the Next Edge Academy. Thanks for taking some time to talk with me, Bruce. Yeah, no problem. Thank you very much. Can you tell us a little bit about your background as an athlete and as an instructor? Sure. Um, I started competing and training in you know Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and martial arts back in 2000. So I got super interested in and actually ended up just kind of traveling all over the world and training and competing. So it seems like once I started it, I just kind of um, really fell in love with it, wanted to continue learning. The tough part was that we live in South Dakota, and there's not a lot of really good areas to train uh, here at the time there wasn't. And so that uh, involved me putting a lot of money on my credit card early on and and traveling to, uh, you know, L.A. and New York and places in Florida and down in Brazil and uh, all over trying to uh, accumulate skills and bring them back to here because that was a uh, certainly a kind of a an area that I wanted to bring to to Sioux Falls just because or South Dakota I should say just because uh I felt like it was lacking here so well, that's cool and then when did you start uh what year did you start instructing we started teaching or I started teaching in 2008 okay. so we've been uh, almost nine years now and is it still I know it's gone through went through a huge popularity for a while is it still kind of increasing yeah, I, I definitely think it is. The, the craziest thing for me is that um, really the, the landscape of, uh, you know, MMA as a whole has, has really changed when you, especially from the, the training aspect of it. When you started, it was basically, okay, let's go and, you know, try to hit each other as hard as we can and try to, uh, you know, have really tough, uh, really tough training sessions to really a, a scientific approach now on this end. And that probably was a shift you know, six or seven years ago where I think it started to get a little bit more spotlight and people realized that they had to change a lot of that because of the coaches that were taking the scientific approach were getting a lot better, uh, a lot faster. Okay, great. And that that's a great segue into the main sure. thing we wanted to talk about today is kind of how you have incorporated some sports science and motor learning kind of uh, ideas into your instruction and coaching. So kind of to get that rolling, I know one of the initiatives you done, you've done with your coaching is a flipped classroom. So can you tell us a little bit about how you've changed in that way? Sure. With that, you know, about we started that two and a half, almost three years ago. And so as a coach, I'm, you know, I'm, if you go to any other, to my knowledge, if you go to any other, you know, MMA or martial arts gym, usually they'll have a progression. So they'll have a beginner's class, they'll have an intermediate class, and then they'll have an advanced class or In a lot of the case, I would say probably 90% of the gyms, they don't really have a progression. To be honest with you, a coach will come in and they'll, you know, as they're driving into the gym, they're going to say, okay, what am I going to be working on today? And that's what they're learning. So somebody that is, has done it for, you know, say two months or even if it's their first day, might be doing the same thing as somebody that's been there for 10 years. And so I I started doing a lot of research and decided that that's probably going to be the best way for us to I'll be able to accommodate everybody in the gym, uh, you know, from the first aid person to somebody that's been there for 10 years. Because if you, you know, have it where, okay, you're learning the same thing, the person that's been there for 10 years is going to be super bored with it. And the person that um, has been doing it, you know, for one day, it's probably almost too far advanced for them. And so we started slowly developing that flipped classroom 
uh, setting. And it's, uh, it was kind of rough at first just because nobody had really seen it before. And now it, it was something that I could never go back to. It's just really nice where when I come in, I don't even want to say necessarily that I'm a coach anymore. It's almost like I'm a facilitator in the fact that I'm just walking around, you know, everybody's kind of done their homework and then they come in and they're drilling in that time. And so it's, it's nice for me as a coach because, you know, in an hour long class or a 45 minute class, I'm going to spend previously, you know, 15 to 20 minutes of that talking, explaining a lot of this stuff. And then they're going to do it for 15 or 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes at the most. Now they're getting a, a full 45 minutes or an hour of, being able to drill uh, different techniques, attach uh, other techniques to ones that they previously learned, things like that. And so it's, you, you know, it was hard in the beginning just because people weren't used to it. But now I don't think we have anybody that would probably ever go, want to go back. Okay, great. The kind of homework you give them, is it, is it uh, videos that you've created of mostly? Correct. Yep. So we uh, we have a curriculum of, okay, if you're, it's essentially level. So level one, level two, level three, all the way, you know, we're constantly creating new levels. And so with that, there's probably about 20 techniques in each level. And so we have a learning management system that is um, on our website and people can watch as few or as many of those um, as they want. So usually the instructionals are only about two minutes long, about, uh, you know, one technique, and then they will watch as many of those as they want and they come in and they can drill, you know, one technique if they want to do that, four techniques, or if they want to do all 20 in that same day, they can. Okay. That's great. So you uh, you have d- different uh, videos for different skill levels. And then are they getting any, I guess they're getting the feedback mainly from you when they, when they come, right? So they're practicing Correct. by themselves and they're, you're just kind of doing more refinement, right? Exactly. And then um, with that, once they feel like they want to move on from, you know, a level one to level two, um, then either I will sit down with them and go through those techniques and um, say, okay, those all look good except for these three. Let's keep working on these three until I feel like we've got it to a, uh, you know, quote unquote mastery level. And, uh, if I'm not there or if we have multiple people doing it, what I'll do is just videotape those and say, okay, you see this here, let's, you know, work on these three techniques. Once we have those corrected, then we can move on to, to level two. Because my hope is that everybody gets those to, uh, not almost like a mastery level learning, but not to a, a perfect level, but pretty good before they move on rather than just saying, okay, that looked okay. Let's move on. I'd like to have it to a point where they should be able to do it, teach it, tech, and I'm actually able to uh, to do it live. Okay. All right. So did I understand that? Are you doing kind of self-modeling? So you're, are you videotaping them and giving them videos of themselves as well as you? <laughs> yep. And so we, we do that both for uh, the technique side when they want to move on and then also when they're sparring as well. So we don't do any coaching live during sparring. Um, so whether they're doing wrestling sparring or boxing sparring, things like that, you won't hear any of the coaches say anything at that time. We'll videotape those sessions and then I'll go back and say, okay, you know, stop the video recording and say, okay, work on this spot here, work on this spot here. Just because on, on our end, as a coach, if I were to say, okay, you know, in the middle of them doing something live, okay, fix this or fix that, it kind of inhibits the person that's doing well and helps the other person that's uh, is doing poorly, but the chances of them remembering it uh, are probably going to be fairly low just because for us, it's a very high anxiety sport, in which case, you know, your uh, heart rate's going to be up quite a bit. I think other sports aren't necessarily probably going to be as as bad as that. You know, the baseball, maybe you can make a correction there compared to something where somebody's trying to throw a punch at you and you're having to make a quick reaction. The chance of you being able to remember that correction later is probably fairly low compared to watching it on a video and saying, OK, you know, fix this next time. Fix that where you can watch it from the comfort of your home rather than having to do it while somebody's trying to punch you in the face. Yeah, no, I think that makes a lot of sense. And in thinking about that, are you also kind of thinking about some of the ideas of, you know, from motor learning research where you talk about giving people too much feedback, like constantly right. correcting? Is is that part of that motivation too? For sure. I I really, it, it's funny to, to listen to other coaches too, because now, um, especially after, um, I think it was actually one of your podcasts. That where you talk about, okay, if you can get it to within 15% of where you, you know, want it to be, then it should be good rather than, you know, trying to make it super nitpicky with that. Yeah. If we can get one thing done, you know, per training session, I'm, I'm super happy rather than trying to change, uh, you know, 12 things because I, I realize that that's probably just not going to happen. Yeah. And I, and I know we, we talked a bit of this a bit briefly before, but the, the interference problem must be big in, 
in martial arts, right? You're, all the moves are built off something else. So, you know, right. trying to not do this instead of that must be a real challenge. Yeah, that's something that we're uh, we're currently trying to to change some of the curriculum stuff that we're we're moving around just because of that situation. You know, previously, and again, if you go to any other gym, they're going to teach it as far as systems. And so, you know, they might try to lock out an arm one way and then make a small variation and do it another way. And that it, it has created quite a bit of interference. So when you get to, you know, trying to uh, have those folks replicate that technique, sometimes it gets jumbled between those two or three techniques that they have there. So um, we're switching around a little bit to where they're, you know, each technique is vastly different than the other one. And then using the same technique, but from a different position. So maybe you might lock the arm out that particular way, both from one position and the second position. So the technique remains the same. The position changes, though. And how how uh, have students kind of embraced this? It must have been a, kind of a big change at first. Again, in the beginning, it was kind of tough just because, like I said, nobody's really seen this before. And they're not used to having to do that little bit of homework beforehand. But, I mean... Really, I'm asking them now to invest, you know, five, maybe 10 minutes before they come in in that. And it it helps them so much because now the anxiety level of not knowing what to do has gone down quite a bit because the, the nice spot is if you, you know, say you didn't do that five to 10 minutes beforehand, you can just do the previous workload, you know, and so they never feel like they've kind of uh, being or they're being pushed to, you know, do the next technique or the next technique that's up to them. So the anxiety there has gone down quite a bit. Our numbers have uh, increased uh, tremendously. For a small gym, you know, we have about 150 people here, which is a, a decent-sized gym. But I mean, globally, that would probably be average or smaller. But our number size, you know, we'll have 35 people in a in a class, and that is that's huge compared to where it was at before this, where we'd have 10 to 12. I and mean, so it's it's nice because we're getting more you know bodies in there, which is going to also uh, help out a little bit, just because of the fact that you can get more looks from different body types, different uh, ability levels, things like that. Yeah, no, that that sounds really good. And uh, do you still see, even though you're kind of doing this more individualized instruction, do you still see benefits of having different skill levels in the same class? Is it still, you still think they're they're learning from each other? I think so. The, the nice part about this way is the the fact that, you know, so somebody that's been there for 10 years can help out somebody that's brand new um, and they kind of develop that kinship there, which is kind of nice. And then also the the person that's been there for 10 years or, you know, even five years, start to feel like they're part of the process as well, which is kind of nice. On the the other end of it, you know, if I was to go back to the the old way, I think if it was somebody that was coming in maybe two to three times a month, I would probably say that that way would be, the older way would be better just because you would learn a specialized system, if you will. A lot of times they would be teaching a repetitive move uh, a lot of times compared to this where in an ideal situation, I would want them coming in, you know, two or three times a week to continue progressing through that system. Um, if somebody was to come in two or three times a month, uh, I think that would be just hard to progress. Compared to the other system, though, they would probably learn a little bit better through that system just because of the fact that they would be learning uh, one specialized system. Now you mentioned students kind of helping show uh, lesser skilled people the, the techniques. Does that help them learn themselves? Oh, definitely. So uh, one of the, the biggest things I, I started coaching, you know, still when I was competing quite a bit, I, you know, in 2008, it's funny because I was a, a decent competitor in 2008 and 2009 for that particular belt level. It was a purple belt at that time, which is, you know, if you're not familiar with it, I would consider it like a, you know, comparable maybe to a, a Juco college championship. Uh, but I won the world championships in 2009. So it's funny that in 2008, I be, started becoming a coach. And 2009, a year later, I think because a lot of what you're talking about, having to really delve into learning the techniques became a world champion at that, you know, at that level. So it was kind of a, a huge change for me. What For me, I was it was all the anxiety of not wanting to look like I didn't understand, didn't know these techniques. And so it was a lot of uh, learning information before I went and tried to, uh, to coach it. So it, on one end, it made me have to become a gives, gave me more anxiety, I guess, in coaching, but it uh, gave me the boost basically to have to go out there and really learn every little bit of that technique. So another thing, so you know, this is kind of an issue in a lot of sports is how you kind of transition from teaching uh, athletes how to do something, the techniques and the skill, to when to use it, right? Kind of this decision making, the 
that kind of aspects. How, how do, you, do you try to do that in practice to teach them when to do the different techniques? So, so for us, I like to have all of our students kind of look at, at uh, top level guys and model themselves after some of those guys and look at some of the openings that they create uh, from there. But also it, a lot of that comes from our videotaping to saying, okay, you know, here was the best time for you to be able to do this. You missed this timing here. Let's go, you know, try to get that. The nice part for us is we're especially or essentially practicing live every night with uh, on the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu side. That's something where you can go 80, 90, 100 percent against each other and have very low risk of injury. I mean, obviously, you can't do that with striking because that you would run into brain uh, damage issues. But with grappling, you can really go close to 100 percent every single time and get some true results out of doing those you know, live sessions and saying, okay, I missed my timing here. I could have been doing this a little bit different here. So videotaping a lot of those and being able to sit back with, uh, you know, that particular athlete and say, oh, this was a, uh, you know, a timing issue here, or this was a technique issue here, or, you know, just plain, you know, I didn't understand this technique. So that's, uh, that's probably the, been the, the biggest help for us is being able to videotape those. And the nice part about that is too, is that if, you know, somebody starts getting into the slump that they feel like, okay, down on themselves or they don't feel like they're progressing really i can watch video or have them watch video from three months ago six months ago a year ago and say okay this is the person you know you feel like you're not getting better but i can point to this six months ago you watch this video and tell me that you're not better yeah i think that's an interesting way to think of it you know the opening when you're saying you know, looking for openings is almost you can match it up with the idea of affordances kind of we talk about in motor learning right this mm -hmm. this this body position affords this move against your opponent. So I think that's a really, really interesting way to look at it. And I guess the kind of last area I wanted to talk to you about, Bruce, is kind of a big one is, you know, as a, as a coach and instructor, how well do you think kind of the research side is serving you? And what would you like to see more of and what could be done better? <laughs> I know that's a huge <laughs> question, but I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. The, the biggest thing I think now is, is really getting a lot of that information out there more. I know some of, you know, not necessarily what I would want to see more in the research side, but just uh, facilitating a lot more of that information out there. I feel like uh, a lot of the sports side of things are still stuck in older methods. And I'd like to see if, you know, a lot of the schools, as far as MMA gyms, you know, football, basketball, things like that, were to uh, incorporate a lot of those what the difference would be. And I, I think that would be huge for me, you know, the, the same way that, uh, they were teaching in, you know, the 1920s, 1930s is really the same way that they're teaching now. And with the uh, addition of technology and things like that and research, we found out it's amazing to me that certain gyms and certain coaches will still continue to teach the way that they were taught just because that's kind of the ideal that they feel like they, they need to continue even when they know that uh, that's maybe not the best possible method. So mine would be, you know, trying to get more of that information out there that, okay, this is, uh, you know, an understood, you know, science and trying to push that out more t into practice with some of the gyms that we have. Yeah, it's a tough thing to kind of show the way that we do in research kind of the benefits, but it'd be really interesting to do some studies comparing different methods. And uh, that right. just made me think of another... How much is kind of the resist? Is there a resistance to using technology as well? It must have been a big, must be a huge effort for you to make all these videos and all the recording. <laughs> as a, someone that does it a bit on my side, I know it's not a trivial thing to make put together a video for someone. Sure. Mm -hmm. the uh, The biggest thing for us is that we, you know, I used to try to make them look super nice and you know put in you know titles and all sorts of stuff, and then um, after that it just became okay. I need to continue to pump this information out there. So now it's. Maybe not the, the most edited video, but the content is very good usually. And so trying to put those out there as much as possible. The nice part about it is that if I can incorporate some of the students or you know athletes into that, they get excited about it. They like to add content, things like that. So now we have people that are adding their own content and building that uh, knowledge base from not, not only myself, but from other people. And that's kind of nice as, as well. So in the beginning, it was, it was kind of cumbersome. You know, it was probably... 30, 40 hours in front of a camera filming all these things because that I think a lot of people look at, you know, MMA or mixed martial arts as this kind of sport that's maybe not very evolved. But if you look at it from, 
this side, it's, it's very specific in timing and, and things like that. And so, you know, having to come with a, a video for every single instance is kind of a, kind of a huge, uh, endeavor. But, um, once that's done now, it's, it's kind of fun because you'll see all the students starting to add their little input, me continuing to add my input. And, uh, now it's not taking me any more time than it, than it would before. So that initial investment was well worth it. I think just because there's that knowledge that I don't need to talk about anymore. I can just go ahead and say, okay, let's watch this video. I'll talk about it. And then now I'll have 20 people watching different things compared to, you know, me explaining it for the 27th time. Yeah, no, I could totally see that. Yeah, there is a lot of uh, upfront investment, but I could see it paying off. Uh, well, that's great, Bruce. I'm really uh, excited to hear you kind of implementing something, these kind of things. So thanks for taking some time to talk with me. Thank you very much. Thanks again for the great discussion, Bruce. It's really exciting to hear that some ideas from research are helping to improve your coaching. You can learn more about Bruce from the links in the show notes. Coming soon on the Perception in Action podcast, a deeper look at the concept of motor memory. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now. Authors and Lewis.